going. We're going. Okay. All right, you guys, we're going to get started. Uh, today we have Professor Brittany Stringfellow Odie. Um, she is the director of the Pepperdine Legal Aid Clinic at Union Rescue Mission. Uh, she's been in that position since 2003, and she serves a lot of the similar client base that we do, and she's here to talk to us about trauma-informed lawyering. Hello. How many of you were with me last time when we talked about taking care of ourselves? Does that sound familiar? Okay, so it won't be too much. We're going to repeat too much. Uh, so, like Jessica said, I have been down on Skid Row for 15 years. I actually volunteered three before that, or four. Anyway, I've been there a long time. Um, and so a lot of my research has kind of been more about how do I sustain my career as a Skid Row lawyer and with, with a high need group. Um, and so that's where kind of all of this flows from. So last time I came and talked about how do we sustain ourselves so that we're effective. And that also really weaves nicely with our topic today, which is how do we approach our clients where they're at. Um, and I think the rest of the world has been a little bit ahead of lawyers on this topic, but we're catching up. Here we come. Um, I'm finding lots of things. You just didn't ever hear about it in law school, and then when you do work with trauma-impacted folks, you're like, wow, that would have been nice to hear about, you know? So we look to medicine, we look to psychology, we look all around social work and look for ways to um, kind of gird ourselves for the work that we want to do and learn more about how to not re-traumatize our clients. I guess that's sort of the goal. My goal today is not to turn you into therapists. I am not a therapist. I could never train you to be a therapist. But I think that's kind of a misunderstanding about this stuff. It's not, okay, I'm going to give you the tools to now solve all their problems. And I actually think if you tried, if you looked at it from that perspective, it would be pretty damaging to you as a person because you don't have the tools to do that. Um, but instead, I want to take the perspective of one of my friends who is a clinical psychologist and she teaches um, doctors how to work with trauma-impacted folks. And one of the responses she often gets is, you know, I'm not a therapist. I don't have time for this. I only am with these people for five minutes, whatever. And her response, which has really rung true for me, is that's true, and you don't need to be a therapist. That's what you should send us for. However, those five minutes matter, and you can do a lot of damage in them if you're not trained. And so I guess what I want for us is that in our time with our clients, that we just wouldn't do damage, that we would be as helpful as possible, that we would resource them, but their interaction with us would not be detrimental. Sound like a fair <laughs> assessment? Um, the other thing I want to share up front is this is a funny thing for me to end up working on because my mom, who was a Head Start nurse for 25 years when I was growing up, um, had this saying, and the grammar's not quite right, except for my siblings and I would try to figure out how to fix the grammar, it doesn't come out right either. But they would, she would always say, when we would complain about the reaction we got from someone, there's always a reason why people act the way they do. So see, the grammar's not quite right. But the sentiment is very true, and I think thinking of our practice from a trauma-informed stance is just realizing there's a reason why someone's acting this way. And maybe if I learn more about it, I can respond to them in a positive way. So that kind of sets the framework for what we're going to do today. I think it's helpful to define trauma. There's three E's in trauma that you, you want to remember. It's an individual trauma that results from an event or a series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and that has lasting adverse effects. Um, of the, on the individual's functioning and mental and physical and social or spiritual well-being. So it's an event that is experienced and has these lasting effects. So that's sort of what we're all working from when we think of trauma. Now, when we think of what those might be, they're varied because it matters about the individual, what kind, how they're going to respond to a particular event, right? So common events are these kinds of examples. So observing or experiencing physical, sexual, or emotional abuse, childhood neglect, having a family member with a mental health or substance abuse disorder, experiencing or witnessing violence in their community or while serving in the military, and then also just generally poverty and systemic discrimination. So when you think of your clients, do any of these ring true for who you're seeing? All, like all, all right? All yeah, so like I said, our clients are often the same, often our clients <laughs> are actually the same people. <laughs> I'm helping on a civil matter, and they're helping, you're helping um, with their family matters. So when you look at all of these things, it's important to just recognize that any of these things can cause a trauma. And 
they may cause different effects in different people, right? So you may have someone who goes through divorce and not traumatized. Someone who experiences divorce as a child, and they are. So it's all very individual. It has to do with what, how it affects them and what the lasting effects, effects are on that person. How, are you familiar with the phrase ACEs, or adverse childhood effect, or experiences? Adverse childhood experiences. Some? Okay. It's helpful to sort of uh, just break that down a little bit here when we're talking about these kinds of things that cause trauma. Essentially, an adverse childhood experience is that. Um, and it's something that you experience under 18. And what, in the last 20 years, people have started to study is what, what kind of is the breakdown? How does this um, affect people? And it's, they've broken it into three categories, abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. So really, it's all of these types of things. So household dysfunction could mean a parent or a family member in, incarcerated. It could be that someone in the house has a mental illness. Uh, neglect could be emotional or physical, and abuse could be all the different ways as well. So you're looking at those types of things. In, in the last few years, they've even broadened it to look at societal things. What is your neighborhood like? What, is, what kinds of things did you see as a child out in, out in your neighborhood? That kind of thing. But essentially, what they found is that two out of three adults have experienced one or more, and that one out of eight have experienced four or more. And the reason I want to bring up the number four is that four is kind of a tipping point. And when you, what you see in the studies is that when someone has experienced four or more of these kinds of experiences, that you're going to see it lean way more toward trauma, and you're also going to have all sorts of increased risk ratios. Because this, what they realize is that these experiences, while it's not an indicator of just like, this is your life, it's all planned, right? But what they're finding is that you have more illness, you have more um, behaviors like addictions and depression and all sorts of things. And then you also have just your life potential. Those, those things change for you. So when you've got someone in front of you who's had four of these experiences, I just want to heighten our sensitivity so that that is an increased risk ratio. So now when you think of your clients, how many have experienced four? Probably still all of the above, right? So that, for me, just sort of reorients the way that I experience people. I want to give you a definition of trauma-informed lawyering as well. And this comes from an article by Katzenhalder, The Pedagogy of Trauma-Informed Lawyering. Two professors that are doing what I'm doing, trying to do is get this stuff into the law schools before you are first you know, affected by it in your, in your work. So the hallmark of a trauma-informed practice are a couple of things. When the practitioner puts the realities of the client's trauma experiences of the, at the forefront of engaging with the client. Number two, adjust the practice approach informed by the individual client's trauma experience. So you're aware and you adjust. Two things. And then the third, which I think is really easy to pass over, but I don't want us to, is that trauma-informed practice also encompasses the practitioner employing modes of self-care to counterbalance the effect of the client's trauma experience may have on the practitioner. So when I was with you last, we talked a lot about how the, there's shrapnel that comes with this job. And it falls on you whether you want it to or not. So being up close to people's trauma and hearing about their lives and the hard things that they've gone through just has a natural effect on the practitioner. And so being, we have to be really aware of that, assess it, and also do a lot of things to sort of counterbalance and buffer ourselves. And so we'll talk a bit about that today. So the benefits of approaching your lawyering this way, a couple things, it improves the trust and the lawyer-client relationship, right? It improves the interviewing and the, the, um, what you get out of the interview, how open the client might be, is how a lot has a lot to do with how they're experiencing you. Um, it avoids re-traumatization, so that's always a goal. And then if we look at it from the perspective of how do we preserve ourselves, being mindful about all of this stuff is also going to preserve your career. I think it's going to just make you more well balanced and um, not as beaten down by being a part of all of these things. Okay? Did you have a question? No. Oh. All right. So there's a couple of shifts that I want to encourage us to consider. The first one is moving from what's wrong with you. Anybody ever feel like? I'll be real honest. <laughs> uh, we're, we're among friends, right? I'm not saying that I often want to say what's wrong with you. 
Um, this has been one of the most important shifts for me. Moving from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. And this is one of those things that um, all the things that we're talking about, honestly, have got to be um, taken in by not only us as advocates, but also our front desk, our security, uh, whoever is in this office that is going to interact with folks. This kind of training is what makes the difference because when my receptionist has a what's wrong with you approach to the client on the phone, everything kind of spins out from there, right? But if, so we're doing a lot of training about instead of what's wrong with you, what happened to you? Why are you so over, it feels hyper reactive to everything I say. Why do you make these grand assumptions, like all the things that we experience, right? And instead looking at that, like what happened to make that so? Why are you so hyper vigilant in the way that you're advocating for yourself when all I said was I'm trying to figure out a day for your appointment, right? So, and, but, it, but it helps her, right? It helps her to know, okay, this is not about me. This is about what's happening on the other end of the phone. So that's one of the first shift I want to encourage you to do. The second shift I want to encourage you to consider is thinking of trauma-informed lawyering as strength-based on the part of our on, on the part of a client. Um, in trauma-informed services, trauma survivors are seen as unique individuals. So stop there for a second. Sometimes I lump everybody together. Anybody do that? Um, who have experienced extremely abnormal situations and have managed as best they could. So whoever's sitting across from me, whether they are presenting in a way that is going to be helpful to me in court or not, they are doing their best. And it's really helpful to me to see them as that, see them as someone who's doing their best, and seeing them as someone who has overcome more than I could imagine for myself. So there are little cards on the table here. And we're just going to do a couple of quick writes. Sorry, law school. <laughs> it's coming to get you. If you'll grab a card, and I've got more here. I just want to take 10 seconds, and you don't have to share them, I promise. Um, just write down a client that is that strikes you as having, having overcome quite a bit. Because I think it's just a practice that's worthwhile to recognize what they've overcome. A client's name, or? Oh, no, no, just oh, okay. for yourself. This okay. is just your own reflection. You could call them Bob. Everyone could be called Bob. <laughs> This is more for your own reflective practice. So I'm going to recognize that Bob had no parents, was raised on the street, somehow figured to sell himself out, and now is sitting in front of me. And it's pretty darn amazing because I don't think I could have. to look at our clients in a different way. One, rather than what's wrong with you, moving to what happened to you. And two, reflecting on their strengths and the things that they bring to the table and, the, and what they have got to be doing in order to present, even in the way that they are, what that takes. And, and that's just a helpful practice for me. Okay, moving on. So the definition of a trauma-informed approach for realizing the widespread impact of trauma <laughs> and understanding potential paths for recovery. I think for us, it's really important for us to have resources to send folks to. So hopefully that's something that you can have within your agency with just to kind of um, recognize the trauma and be able to send them to folks who could be helpful so that it's not on our shoulders, right? Recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma in clients, family, staff, and others involved in the system. So we'll talk a bit about that today. And then we're going to respond by fully integrating knowledge about trauma into policies, procedures, and practices. So the article that you read in prep for today, uh, my name is not Respondent Mother, talks a lot about humanizing the experience for the Respondent Mother, who obviously has an actual name. And so what, um, one of the things that we want to be thinking through is what is the experience like for our clients 
from when they come here, when they go to court, all those types of things. And in that article, the authors really work through the step-by-step -step of the places where it's dehumanizing, where it's difficult for them, little changes that we could make. And so at the end, I'm hoping that we'll talk a bit about those things. But it's got to be, you know, it's that five minutes with me, I recognize that, but it's also got to be systemic, right? And then finally, we seek to act actively um, resist re-traumatization. So try not to do any harm. So what, the, the, I thought it would be helpful to sort of know what the key pieces are for folks um, that they, they feel empowered and they feel, uh, th these are the pieces that we sort of have recognized are helpful in not re-traumatizing and in helping folks who have been traumatized. So the first one is safety. Um, just thinking about physical safety, emotional safety, the space that we have them in, and we'll walk through each of these. Trustworthiness, this has a lot, this makes me think a lot about um, being careful about what I pr promise. I don't make actually any promises. Um, letting people know what the, the grand scenario might be so that they can know that I'm a trustworthy person and someone that they could rely on. Giving them choice, allowing them to collaborate in the, when we have options that they can collaborate on, giving them a sense of being a part of the puzzle as opposed to just someone that things happen to. Uh, and then obviously respect for diversity, acknowledging the cultural, historical, and gender um, awareness and inclusion, just wanting to make sure that we're not re-traumatizing people in those ways. Um, and in this article, the author talks about studies that have found that um, it all kind of plays nicely because when a, when a client feels heard um, and they feel that there's a fairness in the process, they tend to be much more engaged in the case, much more um, helpful it, with you. And so looking for a voice, respect, neutrality, and understanding. So those things all sort of play together. I mean, when you think about this, it's just good lawyering, right? <laughs> like these are just goals that we set anyway, but they become more and more important when we're looking at, when we're working with folks who have been traumatized. So I just want to walk through a couple of these. So physical safety, is the space that they're in safe? Um, so. I got called on the carpet when I was preparing for this. I got really called on the carpet because sometimes when I don't want to have my client come all the way upstairs because I'm trying to do something quickly, I'll come down and meet with them in our lobby. I don't know if you've ever been in the lobby of a homeless shelter, but it's not, it doesn't feel safe. <laughs> it feels chaotic. People are yelling. People are upset. It's all, you know, whatever. And I've just always been like, well, I just want to get this one thing signed. And this really has stopped this practice for me. I want to think about what space my client is in, whether they're able to feel safe and feel like I'm able to really hear them. So just thinking about where you meet, um, maybe it has even to do with whether they are facing the door or not, like things like that. We're just making sure that folks feel like they're kind of in control of their physical space. That's a helpful one. And then also just asking them is there anything that I could do to change it? Now, you know, you can't do everything, but maybe they just prefer to have their chair just this way, or whatever it might be, just giving them some power in that so that they feel like it's a space that they can relax in and, and um, confide in them. Another is emotional safety. Uh, this has a lot to do with um, choosing your time. So there are times when I feel like my client is receptive to what I, we need to talk about if it's difficult, and there are times when they're completely shut down and trying to choose if there's an option to have conversations at the better time. Um, talking about my own nonverbal communication, right? So do I seem open to them? Am I paying attention to them? One of the things that came up with this quite recently was the um, taking notes. I've now started to say, I'm going to take some notes so that I can be helpful to you in the future, because I didn't really think about until I had read several articles that said, it's a little dehumanizing to someone take notes on you like you're a specimen, right? So communicating what I'm doing and why and creating that sa a little bit safer space, letting them know that I'm for them. Um, I like this consistent but not fixed eye contact. That's funny to me because I'm training law students and they're like trying to learn how to be really good and they just like stare at people and it's a little bit weird. So I don't think you do that. But, <laughs> but giving the eye contact but not, you know, too much. Um, and then being aware of the signs of stress in their body. So whether they are suddenly clammy, whether they are tongue-tied, whether they're twisting that tissue I gave them, you know, watching for these types of signs to realize that they are having an emotional reaction in my presence and I want to be, I want to be present for that. Offering short breaks. Yes, ma'am. How, how would you advise, though, when there's a lot of pressure in the courtroom to move everything along and everything's moving quickly and it's getting certain information from and while 
well, you don't want to re-traumatize your client. You really don't want to have all day to hold their hand and know whether it's going to be okay. Like, that is, so just to repeat for the phone folks, the question is what do you do when you're pressed for time when there's a lot of pressure to keep things moving in court? I think that is absolutely like our catch-22. I think I go back to that doctor saying it's kind of the same thing and I and, um, I think a lot of it's going to have to do with the last time I visited with them. Could I make accommodations then and then explain when I'm in court, I'm not really allowed to do all these types of things. I really want to. I think this is an awful hard experience for you and I wish I could do these things. But here's what's going to happen and we'll talk about that like laying it out in, the, in advance. But building that little bit of rapport so that they know like she would if she could. You know, I don't know. It's not perfect. But it just, we have five minutes, let's make it the best five minutes we can. That, that's my best answer for that. But great question. Okay. <laughs> On trustworthiness, I think you, you show yourself as trustworthy for having shown care for their physical and emotional safety, right? Um, being mindful of their comfort level and just checking in on that as you can. Paying attention to their nonverbal communication, as we talked about, and being as gentle as possible. And then also asking, how are you feeling in the middle or at the end? How did this go? It feels like a little bit much, but I think that's kind of the extra touch that we're going to need to, to do. To, to, and really, you, you know, if, you, if it feels too fluffy, then it's just strategic. If you want this interview to go well and you want the most information possible and most help from the client, this is also a strategic thing, is being helpful to them. It all actually pays off. Giving them choice. Um, I just find that, I mean, this is also just in parenting, right? Like the more choices you can give, <laughs> a little bit better. So um, giving folks choices is it, whenever you see an option to do so. You can't always, and I think it's really good to be upfront about that. When we're in my office, I want to give you these types of choices. When we're in court, we're in this little space. I can't actually do much about it. And, and just sort of comparing that when, when I have the control to do so, I want to give you choices, okay? Um, having them be a part of the logistical details. I get caught on this so often because the quickest way is for me to bark at you, <coughs> right? Or the quickest way is for me to have determined all the details and give you a piece of paper with them determined. But if I can even ask like, is 12 or 12.30 better? Then I find out that when they come at 12, they miss their lunch at the shelter and they haven't eaten. You know, things like that. If I can just ask a simple couple of questions, I can sort of reframe the way that the, the interview or the um, time together is going. So even small, like it says. Um, I think that's pretty much that. So any chance that you can give choice. And then collaboration. Trying to think about doing this with the client as opposed to for or to them. Again, expediency always fights against this. And so wherever I can find the opportunity, I want to try to use it. And um, I think this has also been something where I've been caught where I realize um, I sort of assume a client can't do something. And then I reflect back on how resilient they are and that they've gotten this far. And a lot of things, we, they have a lot of strengths. And so I kind of try to play into those things and ask them to use those strengths to collaborate with me on their case. Um, and then just realizing that they're going to be just more engaged if they feel like they're part of the team. Nobody likes to just sort of be told what to do. I especially. So, so that's sort of the Blue Dot Foundation. They, they've created those questions, but they're just sort of questions to ponder and sort of think like, how can I in integrate these types of things into those five minutes, right? How can, I, how can I do that? So what I'd like to do with our time is a couple of typos. How fun. Um, and these are going to sound you know, completely like you've never heard them before. But these are all taken from the Trauma-Informed Legal Advocacy Project. If you ever are bored and want to go through, they have millions of these. They're super fun. Um, but number one, interviewing. You're having a hard time connecting with your client. They seem distracted, anxious, and agitated, or just shut down. Anyone? Yeah, all the time? <laughs> I did feel like they relate. Okay. So what are some things you can imagine are maybe happening for the client in that moment, other than just being opposite? Yeah. Well, um, in the situation today, um, <laughs> uh, my client was just like fully, um, you know, um, distracted by the father mm -hmm. that she dislikes. 
Mm -hmm. um, and it was I was unable to refocus her on what she needs to do so that she doesn't get her reunification services terminated. Yes. So there's so much happening in that relationship, and they probably aren't often in the same space, right? So it's all just bubbling up, right? That's, mm -hmm. So there's just so much. What else? Anything else come to mind? I had a father yesterday. It was a, an arraignment uh, detention, and uh, they were trying to detain from the mother mm -hmm. a DB case, and the father was so focused on the kids playing and the mother um, and like wanting to go and talk to the mother and be with the mother and like I could hardly get through his his paperwork and he literally like was in the middle of me saying yeah. so this is what I'm going to argue and he would look, I'm like hello can you like can, right. you, can we get through this it was very difficult very yeah. difficult and he only heard what he wanted to hear he was very upset and aggressive so you know he, he only heard you people are trying to take you know my child away, and I was a part of those people. Right. It was very, very difficult. Yeah, yeah. There's so much emotional stuff happening in that moment that you are like, even though you are the central player <laughs> to help them, you are right. barely even noticeable. Yeah, there's so much. So oh, let's just run through a couple of these. A couple of things that, that this um, scenario sort of brings up are traumatic triggers. So if I uh, and I often just think like, <clears throat> if you end up in this building or the courthouse, I, I think it's just, I think it's safe to assume you've been triggered by something, right? Because how often have you either been here before, or you hear here as a child, or someone in your family? It's like walking through that door has just got to take your breath away, right? And then you're suddenly in the room with someone, whether it's DV or you hate them or whatever, all of the yuck of your life is suddenly in one space. And there's all these people moving around and making sounds, but you can't hear it. I just think that it's just so overwhelming. So these types of triggers, environment, people, sights, sounds, smells, I mean, you name it, it can set people off. Yeah. And I just thought about this too. If you think about how many times we'll have a client, we'll have a hearing, and afterwards they're like, what, what just happened? Yeah. And they have no idea what happened. Or they, they won't remember how you argued strenuously for them because they weren't right. listening. They they're like, why didn't you say this? And you're like, I, I did, but it's mm -hmm. because they checked out right when they walked through the front door. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we'll get to that, but that's another I, often dissociation. Like, this is too much emotionally. Mm -hmm. I have to shut it, shut it down. Um, so in that moment, they are likely re-experiencing something. So like with these two situations, they are running through in their minds at least all that goes on with this relationship, these relationships, right? And all of the hurt and all of the everything is just right there. Um, they may dissociate, they may check out, and just sort of that's how they've coped with trauma in the past, and that's their go-to, and so they don't even hear what you're saying. And I think it's also just reasonable to think that they have general, it's likely that our clients have had a negative experience where they are, you know, in the courtroom. Whether it had anything to do with us or not, there's just a negative taste in their mouth for what's happening, right? So that's, I think it's helpful to sort of get a grasp on their perspective. So some things that might help with a trauma-informed response, like I said, this is not at all um, conclusive, but um, anything that you can do to set the scenario beforehand. So sometimes that means a virtual tour of the courtroom that lets them, or it may be talking about um, who will be there, what that will be like for them, uh, who, what each person's job is, things like that. So you've had a conversation when you're not in the traumatic triggering experience, you're having something beforehand that sort of lays it out. Encouraging the client to bring supportive people. Now, I know that that's loaded because sometimes supportive people are not supportive to the situation <laughs> and it becomes a little bit of a circus. Um, have you heard about grounding techniques when someone does check out or dissociate? Yeah. So when they just look like not present, one thing that you can do is sort of bring them to the present by saying, oh, I noticed that you have red shoes on today. Or can I get you a cup of water? Something that brings it back to this moment as opposed to whatever is happening in their mind can be helpful. Um, also, I think talking again with like that, the thing I keep hearing in, in this con in this conversation is no surprises. The, the degree that we can sort of eliminate surprises. So thinking through a, a plan for the night before, 
saying, hey, a lot of times people don't sleep well before they go to court. What's your plan for that? How can, you know, what, what kinds of things could you do to sort of help? Because if you haven't slept, you're not going to do great in court, right? So what can we do to sort of um, work, path, work backwards? Have you eaten? Even just like, can we make sure we have a little protein before you come? Like things like that to sort of help them be able to present and to be here. Um, and then also making a, a what if plan. So here are the different ways this could go. What if, what if your ex is in the room? They're gonna be in the room. So let's talk about what we might do to make that not, a traumatic, not as traumatic as it probably will be, right? So whether it's turning our chair, whether it's um, just talking about it beforehand or whatever, just sort of like acknowledging there's going to be triggers, there are going to be triggers in the room. You haven't seen your kids since they were detained. What are we gonna do? How are we gonna make sure that we're able to communicate when you're having this, I mean, very normal reaction to want to see your kids? Huh. So thinking through those possible triggers and the outcomes and helping them to plan for self calming Some of the things you find in folks that have been traumatized a lot, they don't have, they haven't been taught those self calming or those self-soothing types of things. And so they don't know what to do when they're, you know, they're afraid at the edges and they just feel freaked out. So maybe even just suggesting, have you tried doing a few deep breaths? Can I get you a cup of water so we can focus on that? Something like that. Sometimes, and sometimes it's like, you know, when I feel really nervous or really freaked out, here's what I do. So it's not, you know, imposing upon them really, but just giving them a few ideas that maybe they didn't have. So, so the, in those situations, the more that we can lay trust ahead of time if possible, or at least kind of try to collaborate and do something together, then we're trying to kind of empower them a bit. Okay, next one, memory. Your client doesn't share important information that is relevant to their case. It comes out later during a court hearing. Anyone? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that is some real highlights of my career. <laughs> Finding out some really important things in front of a judge. Okay, uh, so what is why will your what what could be happening that would maybe create a scenario where your client's not telling you the whole story? Because they still don't trust you. They think mm -hmm. that you are the department. Because I think most people here would say one of the things that I always get is. That you took my children away. Yeah. You, 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 you. And that's the first thing you have to break down. It's really explaining that you're here for them. I mean, a lot of times I'll say to them, look, I don't care if you don't like me, you hate me, I don't care if you don't like the social worker. She writes the reports. I'm here to fight for you. I need, if you tell me everything, I always tell them I can leave it so it will look the best for you. Mm -hmm. If you're not honest and it comes out later, it's going to be worse. I mean, it really is that initial here. Try to build you know, the trust that they have, but it's saying certain things, and the longer you do this, you sort of get a sense of who you're talking to, because sometimes they're really angry, but it's the idea, you, 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 and I have to say 20 times, no, 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 I did not, but if right. you do certain things, and I think to impress upon them also, they're going to be ordered to do certain types of court-ordered counseling, and you're going to make my life easier, you're going to have a better chance of getting your client back, just do it, Right. Call me if you don't do it, but it's, you know, and you do don't, you don't have a lot of time, but if I have a client sometimes that really needs more time, I won't let anybody pressure me to get that case ready. I say, look, I'm ready on this, I need more time because she needs a little more time going through everything, and the mm -hmm. court has to understand, but it can't be obviously every single case, right. but you can pinpoint those cases, so it's, it's having the understanding which clients do need more, especially if you have some mental health issues. Right. That sometimes can take a little bit more and you, as you represent, um, unfortunately, parents that do have mental health, there's always things surprisingly that will come out in the hearing. You have right. to be able to know how to control them, mean, you know, and talk them in a way and try not, to, you know, maybe turn your chair. I mean, many times I've sort of turned my chair to try to, you know, speak to my client and have yeah. them do it. So you don't see, but you can see how their anxiety is just boiling up and the court is looking at them all the time, right. especially if it's a mental health. So it's little clues that sort of have to have in your back on how you deal with certain clients because you don't want them to explode, which I have had them do, and then in the closing argument try to still make that look good. But they right. have to have a feeling that you are working for them and however it's built up. You know, if they don't like the report, I'll say, okay, just write me a letter personally to me or email to me exactly what's wrong with the report, exactly. Right. And I'll try to get that. 
that, and it's very, very hard. Now, the worst client is one that's got three or four or five kids. As soon as they meet you, I've lost everybody, you're going to do the same. Right. You know, if they're like fresh meat, something like that, that's never been here, you can mold them a little bit. Mold them like that. But no, but if it's sort of a virgin parent that's coming in. <laughs> So much of what we're doing is bringing, is ushering someone through a foreign country, right? We've got to introduce them to the language, we've got to introduce them to the expectations, and they've, we've got to really quickly establish ourselves as a trustworthy, trustworthy guide, right? So, no, I, I recognize, I mean, I feel like if I didn't do this work, I would, I could, how could I with a straight face even give you suggestions, right? Like I said, we are just trying to better the time we have with them by, by awareness. It's not that we can do this perfectly. This system is too messed up to have this just work perfectly because we can't spend a whole day with each person, right? That's really what it would take in order to build those kinds of relationships. Absolutely. What else might come, so, so not trusting, and then what else might come up in a traumatized individual for memory? Does that ring a bell for anyone? We'll go with Chief. Essentially, it could be that they don't trust you, it also could be they don't remember. Trauma screws with your memory. It just does. It really changes the way you think, it changes the way you cope, it changes the, yeah. But I mean, I, even, even not remembering, I think that a lot of times our clients are reframing it in a different way in their sure. mind. So how they interpret the situation was not at all what's in, what the department is saying. So they didn't say anything because how they see it, yes. it wasn't it could be a what it is. Perspective. But uh -huh. also they're saying it a certain way because they don't want you to think they've done anything. And yeah. they will never say that they've done anything. So a lot of times I will say, okay, you know, it's the arena. I said, well, go home, look yourself in the mirror and try to come to terms as to what really happened and then let me know so we can, you know, right. try to work. But especially with the first meeting, they, I didn't do, I didn't do, I didn't do, I didn't right. do. Okay, well, I assume you didn't do, but, you know, we have to assume maybe on the other side people mm -hmm. said. That's the hardest thing because they don't, when they come, they really don't trust you. Right. Even though we may look trusted, they do not trust us. Right. Unless they're not offended, then they trust us all the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> But the traumatic, the traumatic framework says, even as they're reframing, it may have to do with the way they remember it. So it may not actually be an intention, intentional act on their part. It may be actually how they remember it. So both things, holding intention, not villainizing the person, and allowing that it could be, um, it could be something that they just don't remember. Or they may not remember to recall in the way that it's being asked. So it's just there's a lot happening. And we just talked about, but that whole idea of dissociating. So um, they... They may have just not had it in their mind when they were talking to you. Yes, sir. You know, at the arraignment detention, I, I try to give the client the report first because I don't want to talk to them until mm -hmm. they've read the report because I don't want to hear the bullshit. <laughs> and, and then after they get it and they've looked at it, I start going through it and highlighting the department's points and they always end up telling me, are you against me? Yeah. Okay. And then I tell them, I say, look, they're going to be pushing your buttons just like I am right now. Mm. And so we're practicing. Because you need, and I tell them, don't read the report. I want you to study the report so that when you get interviewed by the DI, mm -hmm. you have a response. And I tell them, I said, the only thing, you, there's no justice in the system. You just get to process. That means you're going to get to put your side into it. Right. And generally, by the end of it, they're okay with me. Because, and, and I get to practice with them if, if they're angry or they're crazy or whatever's going on. You know, I try to identify what they're doing and I say, they're going to push your brother, they're going to lie to you, they're going to set up meetings and they don't show up. Right. Don't, and then not getting them hung into, I guess, blaming other people or saying, well, look at what they're doing. So that makes me okay, or that all that stuff. So the, the extent to which you can explain your framework and how and your strategy to them, I think is going to be really helpful. Because if it just feels combative, then we have the problem of like agitating, right? But it, it seems like when you say, the reason I'm doing this is, 
and it becomes a, a training tool, that can really be helpful. But the more that we can sort of set the framework of like, here's how the system works, here's all the players, and here's, here's my role, and here are the things that I do to try to make you um, shown in the best light. The way that you can sort of frame those, are super, that's a super helpful thing. All right, so again, well, so trauma-informed response suggestions here. Obviously, we come back to the trust, trust, trust. Being really transparent about what information you need. You know, again, I sort of um, was called to pause on this when I'm just asking for mental health records or whatever. And I forget that if someone was digging into my mental health, that's a real dehumanizing situation, right? And so explaining, referencing, here's why I want these things, here's what, how I plan to use them, and giving context and giving empowerment so that it's not just like, I need your references. You know what I mean? It just it can get a little, a little dehumanizing. So just um, doing those types of things. Also, and obviously in the, uh, sounds like in the detention hearing, this is not an option, but multiple meetings, multiple opportunities, and multiple sources of fact. So the more that you can do to try to get information from all different corners, and, and when they're in different moods, it's a helpful way to sort of make sure that you've got all your bases covered. And then also, I'm always um, encouraging my staff to be aware of the vulnerability hangover. So once I've told you everything, I might not answer your phone calls for a few days, right? Because I'm so embarrassed. I've given you all that I've got. I don't want to talk to you. And so a lot of times I'll find, like, why won't they return my call? I'm trying to work on this or whatever. I think it has a lot to do with I'm embarrassed. That's an awful thing I just told you. So being aware of their, their things. All right. We'll do this one quickly. Planning for court. During a court proceeding, your client gets anxious, becomes very angry, or starts to slow their speech and looks like they're checking out. Same ideas, looking for triggers, making sure. My sister who works as a, um, a teacher in LA County Jails, her thing is just make sure I'm not the trigger. That's really her goal. <laughs> Let me not be that for someone, right? So environment, people, sights, sounds. Uh, they may re-experience what they felt when they were immediately traumatized. I think of um, your example, sir, about the woman being, or you had the woman and the, the ex-husband or the man is in the same room. I just think probably there was some re-traumatization from something else that had happened, right? Um, so kind of disso dissociating in order to cope with that. And um, obviously their history of like interaction. So are we going backwards? No. no. Okay, moving on. Same idea. So just being really aware. This is the one that I want to make sure we do because I, this is where it leads into our own stuff, right? So your client is frustrated and angry. You feel like they're demanding and that they blame you for not doing enough to help them. You notice that it's hard to gather the energy to support them. Anyone want to be honest? <laughs> Every day, day. Okay, so, uh, what I, so what's happening from the client's perspective when they unload on you? Yeah. Um, Sometimes the clients don't take responsibility for like their role in um, why they're before the court, mm -hmm. and they think it's because of something that um, the attorney has done that made things worse for them. Um, when in actuality, they haven't done any programs, or right. you know, they haven't been visiting. Or, you know, help me, help you. Right. Yeah. 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 What else might give them the freedom to unload on you? Yeah. <laughs> You might be an easy target um, because they, the social worker, they don't want to explode upon because maybe they're trying to hold it in and not ruin their case, but mm -hmm. like you're the person who's supposed to help them and so yeah. no matter what, like they can sort of beat on you and you <laughs> still yeah. have to help them out. Yeah. I often think of it as like, I, I'm not going to hit them, right? Which is <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> not. So, so I'm safe. You know, I, that's what I sort of think of. Um, okay, what's happening from us? What happens to us when this is our daily practice? You get frustrated and angry back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it makes me defensive. It makes me want to, I always, I mean, I'll just be real blunt. I always, when, when this happens to me, I'm real quick to figure out what's wrong with them. And then I sort of start this cycle of like, you don't really deserve my help because you're a jerk. <laughs> and then I gotta stop because that's not an advocate, right? Um, and then you've got what comes from day in and day out of this is your burnout, your counter-transference, um, the cynicism, all the stuff that comes up. Yeah. Well, and I was gonna say, and when you're getting screamed at, <clears throat> then you just don't wanna, 
because they make that phone call to talk about something that happened with their case. You're like, what time of day am I going to be okay to have a 30 minute conversation where I'm just going to be screamed out the entire time? Yeah. And I'm going to have to fight. And so it's, yeah. it really is just working their case just to provide them information. It's exhausting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, sometimes Absolutely. you tell them just, okay, I'll be right back and then I'll go into the attorney's room and I'll vent and scream and yell. <laughs> then I feel really good. Then I'll go about, you know, if I call yeah. them really nice, I said, I really can't talk to you, you know, just sit down and I'll, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes we can't get a room. I'll wait, but we really just wait to get a room to go in. And talk to. I mean, sometimes when they're going, like, I had a come They don't understand the boundaries, or they are totally in your face. I had one just block the door so I couldn't get in the room. I still have to be professional because then I am sort of looking. There have been times when I'm normally loud. When I've been louder than I normally am, but sometimes they get you to the point, yeah. and you know, I'll try to calm them down, and the bailiff will come out. I'll say, no, 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 everything's under control, but you don't want to make it worse for them. Right. But sometimes you have to say, excuse me, I have to take a moment break, go in, and whatever makes you feel good, just sit down <laughs> and tell yep. somebody, or yell, and then when you feel better, you can go back to them, because you still are the professional. But there are times that I could go and say, oh my God, if I could throw them down the stairs, would you defend me? Because sometimes they push you, but that's a release also. Yeah. But then, even if I'm sort of arguing with them, I always let them know, regardless of what our relationship may be, I may, you know, be truthful with you about here about certain things, but when I go in that room, you know I'm going to fight for your rights and protect you. So let's okay. both calm down, and then usually they, they sense, because my children, you know, it's not my children that are being taken away, it's theirs. Right. And that's when they really get frustrated, or when they read something in a report, like the last minute that comes in, and you've got to let them see, they just go absolutely, you know, ballistic, right. and that's you, but they need to know what's going on, I mean. Right. So, it's just so this fun. this becomes, this is such a good illustration of, I need to take care of myself a bit so that I can come and be professional with you, right? Um, there's a great book called Trauma Stewardship that I'm reading right now, and it talks about trauma mastery. And it talks about how a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, folks who seek out this kind of work where you're around people who have been traumatized. Crazy? Hmm? No. A lot of times there's a little bit of um, chaos in our history. And as an adult, we're trying to master it, so trauma mastery. And so what, what that means is that we've got to be really aware of what we carry to work as well so that we're not overreactive to what now I'm not, I'm not using you as an example of that. I'm just using you as an example of being aware of yourself and taking care of yourself. But I think it's worth, worthwhile to know about our own histories and what would set us off. And I mean, who? <laughs> Being yelled at and you know this close to your face, that's a, that's a trigger, right? So just being aware of our own stuff so that we can continue to do that. And then also just making a practice of being a reflective practitioner so that we can look at that initial situation, that one-time scenario, what set me off, what can I do in the future, what did I do well, all that kind of stuff. And then also I think it makes sense to look at it on a quarterly or monthly, just sort of like how am I doing? How excited am I to go to work? What do I need to switch around? And so I want to give a couple of options for that kind of reflection. All right. So one, just think of a difficult person. Shouldn't be super hard. Um, and let's think about that particular case. What's getting in your way in your ability to work with that client? Has it made it harder for you to feel like you're doing a good job, to feel competent? So, so on that same little card, just Think of a case, and what is it getting at for you? What's what's agitating you? Does it um, make it difficult to feel productive or positive, to stay calm, whatever it is? Just sort of assessing what it is about that particular case that gets at you. Once you've got that, what are a couple of short-term goals that you can set for your work with this particular client? So a goal to keep their trauma history in mind, what they've gone through, try to see them as a strength-based person, whatever you need to do to sort of reframe your interactions with them. 
Uh, maybe, often, I think that you talked about not wanting to make those phone calls. I'll just like avoid it for as long as possible. So now not only am I annoyed by the client, but I also have the, it hanging over my head, which is just an awful combination. So something that you might need to get done that you've been putting off. Uh, sometimes I also over own their mess. And so finding resources for them is a helpful way for me to sort of separate myself from a bit and give myself a little bit of boundary. So then there's some short-term goals. And then anything you can do to make it easier for you. So setting the boundaries about the phone calls. I have 20 minutes to discuss with you right now. I'd love to use all that time to blah, blah, blah. You know, so just giving it like, you know that this isn't an hour and a half. I'm just giving yourself that. Um, picking a certain time of week to work on that specific case. Just get it done on Monday morning or whatever it is. Just sort of get it out of your way. Uh, confiding in a coworker, asking them to encourage you in that. I also like the, using calming or grounding techniques. So the way that we want to help the client come back into the, the uh, present space is by noticing or whatever. You, maybe you just have a coloring book on your desk that you doodle in when you're having a terrible conversation on the phone. Whatever, just sort of <coughs> soothe yourself. Uh, asking for additional supervision, taking breaks, and then just that general making sure that you are taking care of yourself outside of this space so that you come replenished. Setting those types of goals. So that's the that's kind of my presentation on. We want to make sure that we're aware of what's going on with the client and have these tools in our pocket to sort of empower them, but then also to take care of ourselves so that we arrive in a space where we're able to even do these things. Because this is really asking quite a bit, right? This is not a one-to-one -one interaction. This is asking you to bring 150 percent or whatever to the interaction to even make it go normally or to go smoothly, so, or, or whatever we can hope for. And so it is asking quite a bit of you. And so replenishing yourself and making that a priority, I think, is the only way to kind of avoid the stress that comes from this kind of work. So in the article that you were given, uh, they list a bunch of things that the, that particular courthouse was doing. I don't know if anyone's had a chance to read this. But I would encourage you to look through, since we don't really have time to do it collectively, um, Building a court process that supports parents and action steps related to that. And just read through those suggestions and think about what is your agency doing, what could we, what could we tweak, what, um, what needs to be overhauled, whatever it might be. But what are the best practices that you've got going and what kinds of changes might you make going forward? That's what I've got. Thank you. The last page of your um, handout has a bunch of resources if you want to dig into this a bit more.